It's April 13th, 1996, and Southampton's home stadium, the Dell, a tiny 15,000 capacity stadium, is rocking. The lowly Saints have just gone 3-0 up against Sir Alex Ferguson's high-flying, star-studded Manchester United. And it's not even half-time yet. The man who scored the third goal, and who was instrumental in creating the first two as well, is a hero on the South Coast who never has to pay for his drinks in town. Attacking midfielder Matt Letizia. Letizia in the centre, Heaney is also, it's Shipperley. Schmeichel's missed that, Letizia surely! This is amazing, it's 3-0. Fergie was so furious at half-time that he famously ordered his United side to change their kits from their grey colour that allegedly blended the players into the crowd, hmm, to blue and white stripes. But it didn't work, Southampton stood firm and won 3-1. A matter of weeks before United won their third Premier League title. Fast forward a few months to October 96 and Manchester United return to the Dell and suffer a 6-3 defeat. That's one of their heaviest and most memorable defeats in Premier League history. The man at the centre of Southampton's shock win was, you guessed it, once again, Matt Letizia, who scored an unbelievable lob over goalkeeper Peter Schmeichel from outside the box. Pitch again, here's Letizio facing May once more, he's round Palliser, he's round May, oh and he chips Schmeichel and that is a sublime piece of skill. My name's Ryan Bailey and in this episode of Soccer 101 I'll be explaining who Matt Letiz was, why he was one of the best Premier League players of all time and why he was never awarded with the international career with England that he deserved. If you've never heard of him before, you might be asking why this French person, Matt Letizier, would play for England anyway. Well, Letizier's name sounds French, but he isn't. He was born on Guernsey, an island off the coast of France that's neither France nor England. It's self-governed, but they speak English and they use the English currency, the pound. It's not part of Great Britain, but it loosely is. It's kind of complicated, but being from Guernsey, he was eligible to play for all the nations of Great Britain, and he chose England. More on that later. Letizia joined Southampton's youth training scheme after touring the area with Guernsey's under-15 team. He made his debut for the first team at Southampton in 1986 at the age of 18 and proceeded to stay with the club for his entire professional career. That's 16 years, 443 league appearances and 162 goals all in Southampton colours. Letizia was arguably the first big star of the Premier League, which started in 92. He was the epitome of natural talent, a gifted flair player and a maverick. He didn't do a lot of running, he didn't appear to have the build of an elite athlete, and he probably wouldn't mind me saying he didn't have poster boy looks, but he was capable of producing moments of breathtaking magic week in, week out. His control of the ball and the sensational goals he scored were worthy of the price of admission alone. He enjoyed his most prolific season in 93-94 when he scored 25 league goals and almost single-handedly kept Southampton from being relegated. The following season, he won goal of the season for a 40-yard chip against eventual Premier League champions Blackburn. Yes, a 40-yard chip. Here's the Tissier setting off on one of those arcing runs of adventure and letting fly, oh, and scoring a terrific goal. Even by his elevated standards, that is something special. He has this talent for making the extraordinary seem straightforward. If you have a moment later on today, search for Matt Letizier top 10 goals on YouTube and you'll see the kind of magic he could produce with both feet from outside the box. And he was also notable for his exceptional record from the penalty spot. He converted from the spot 47 times from 48 attempts and he's thought to be one of the best players ever to place a ball on the spot from 12 yards. If you went to the Dell around the time he played, something I was actually lucky enough to do myself, then you would have seen many fans wearing his number seven shirt in the stands. But instead of his name, the shirts carried his nickname, Le God. 
If you think it's hyperbolic to describe him as one of the greatest Premier League players of all time, then I invite you to look at a Eurosport fan poll from 2020, in which he was voted the greatest Premier League player of all time. In the bracket-style vote, the Southampton legend beat out Cristiano Ronaldo, Steven Gerrard and Alan Shearer before getting 60% of over 21,000 votes cast to beat Thierry Henry in the final. Yes, in a galaxy of legends who've played the game at the very highest level, it was a humble man from a tiny island in the English Channel that was deemed the best as recently as last year. Having been lucky enough to witness him play in person a few times during my formative soccer watching years, I can attest to the fact that it was pretty breathtaking to be in his presence when he was doing his thing. So, as one of the biggest names of the Premier League era, held in the same esteem as the Henri's and Shearer's of this world, one can only assume Letizier had a bright and eventful international career. Well, no. Letizier played for England a grand total of eight times. Six of those were friendlies, and one of those friendlies was abandoned when crowd trouble marred a meeting with the Republic of Ireland. His only two competitive games were World Cup qualifiers against Moldova and Italy. In the former, he came on as a sub for 10 minutes when England were already 3-0 up, and in the latter, he was pulled off after an hour. He also made six appearances for the England B team, which is a team they used to have before fixture congestion killed it off in 2007, and he played a couple times for the under-20 team too. One of the greatest talents of his generation, never went to a major tournament and didn't score a senior goal. So why didn't Letizia play more for England? Well, there are a few reasons, and they're not necessarily to do with Letizia himself, but more what he represents. I'll get right into that after I tell you about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN lets you change your online locations you control where you want sites to think you're located. Therefore, you can use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. ExpressVPN lets you choose those movies and shows from almost 100 different countries too. This means you can supercharge your Netflix subscription with way more content. For example, The Dark Knight and Brooklyn Nine-Nine are on Canadian Netflix. Pitter patter, get at her, figure it out. Rick and Morty are on French Netflix. The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is a long way from a playground in West Philadelphia because it's on Australian Netflix. Fun. This works with any streaming service, not just Netflix. I'm talking Hulu, BBC iPlayer, and even YouTube. And if you're outside the US on vacation, when that eventually becomes a thing, you can use it to gain access to your favorite US streaming services. I've used ExpressVPN in the past, for example, to watch HBO while in the UK. And I now use it to watch me some BBC iPlayer. Hmm. You can stream in HD, that's no problem. There's no buffering or lag. It's compatible with all your devices, your phones, your laptops, your media consoles, your smart TVs, and much more. Not only does it let you change your location, it also encrypts your data and lets you surf the web safely and anonymously. And boy, are you in luck because we've got an offer for you. If you go to expressvpn.com slash soccer, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash soccer. One more time, expressvpn.com slash soccer for an extra three months free. Thank you very much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's show. Back now to the Letizia story. The Saints playmaker played through the tenures of five England managers, Bobby Robson, Graham Taylor, Terry Venables, Glenn Hoddle, and Kevin Keegan, none of whom appeared remotely interested in giving him a fair run in the team. Why would so many different managers fail to give him a chance when his talent was so obvious on the domestic front? Well, one of the primary reasons is not because of Letizia himself, but the kind of player he was. Letizia was a maverick, a flair player, who brought individual skill and marched to the beat of his own drum. That's the kind of player that many national team setups have built a squad around, but England has a tradition of ignoring the maverick player that goes back several decades. And that's a tradition that arguably lives on today too. In the 1970s, English soccer was awash with maverick players, long-haired, free-spirited individuals who dazzled crowds with their silky skills and ability to turn a game with a few solo moments, while leading glamorous lifestyles off the field. Striker Frank Worthington, for example, was nicknamed Elvis at Leeds due to his fashion choices and his popularity with the opposite sex. He drove a Mustang to training and he wore his hair long at a time when his Leeds teammates were banned from doing so. 
Peter Osgood, meanwhile, earned the title the King of Stamford Bridge during a decade at Chelsea in which he scored all manner of breathtaking goals. His flamboyance was adored, not least by Hollywood star Raquel Welsh, who chose Osgood as the player she wanted to meet while in London to promote a film. She was later photographed wearing a t-shirt that read, I scored with Peter Osgood. Charlie George, a Highbury hero when Arsenal won the 1971 title and reached the 72 FA Cup final, was a long-haired rebel who showed his cantankerous side on several occasions, including, but not limited to, the moment he headbutted future England manager Kevin Keegan. Then there was Rodney Marsh, who you might know from Sirius Radio or his stint with Fort Lauderdale in the NASL. He enjoyed a storied career in England, earning successive promotions with QPR and a League Cup winner's medal in 1967, before coming within touching distance of the league title with Manchester City. Worthington, Osgood, George and Marsh were the most talked about players in English soccer in the 70s, and they all earned less than 10 England caps each. Sir Alf Ramsey, who won the World Cup with England in 1966, was notorious for demanding subordination and restraint from his players. That culture carried through the 60s and 70s to Ramsey's successor, Don Revy, who took charge in 1974. The Maverick player simply wasn't trusted, even if it was to the detriment of the national team, which it often was. After winning the World Cup on home soil in 66, the three Lions entered the wilderness, failing to qualify for four consecutive tournaments, the 72 and 76 European Championships and the 74 and 78 World Cups. At a time when they might have needed an injection of flair, a spark of imagination, none of the Mavericks were able to establish themselves. The mistrust of the Maverick player affected several subsequent generations in England. Supremely gifted players like Glenn Hoddle and Letizier were barely given a glimpse by the Three Lions. And it's ironic, by the way, that Glenn Hoddle himself became England manager in the 90s and only gave Letizier two caps. So the long-held perception is that the England team only recruited players who are regimented and able to fit neatly into a structured team. Mavericks are unreliable, and since the manager who won the World Cup in 66 didn't like them, they haven't really been used since. Perhaps the only notable exception to the rule is Paul Gascoigne, who is the star of an earlier episode of Soccer 101, you can go look that one up, but Gaza and Letizia's prime coincided with one another, and there's no way England would have been able to accommodate Two Maverick players. That would be far too much fun and chaos now, wouldn't it? I interviewed the legendary commentator Martin Tyler on the subject of England players a few years ago for a piece in The Athletic, and he espoused the view that Maverick players, like Letizia, didn't fit in because they weren't workhorses. There's always a suspicion of the Maverick, Tyler told me. You need people who give you a consistent 7 or 8 out of 10 for 90% of the season. The players who might be circus acts, as he called them, don't do that. On his day, Letizia was unplayable and utterly brilliant. Unfortunately for him, he was either 10 out of 10 or virtually anonymous. A circus act, as Martin Tyler might have called it. There was no in-between for him. Letizia was what was known as a luxury player. Someone who doesn't track back, do any defending, try to win the ball back or help the team off the ball. It's a term used to describe someone who may not be at peak fitness, but whose magical boots make up for athletic shortcomings. Letizia created great memories for fans and his YouTube highlight reels live on in infamy, but it's not entirely unfair to class him as a luxury player. Something else that may have also held Letizia back from the international scene is something that's actually considered one of his most admirable qualities, the fact he stayed loyal to Southampton for his whole career. It wouldn't have been hard for Letiz to make a move to a title-challenging team during his career, but his agent had very little to do thanks to his unwavering loyalty to the club that gave him a chance in the first place. Unfortunately for Letizier, the club he chose to stay loyal to was a club that existed in the bottom half of the table. Not a high flyer like Manchester United or Newcastle. Yes, Newcastle were title challengers back then in the mid-90s, which is pretty much the last time they showed any ambition. If you look at the England squad for Euro 96, for example, the players almost exclusively come from big clubs. If you play for Southampton or Leicester or Coventry or any number of clubs who weren't big, in inverted quotes, you generally didn't stand a chance of getting in the England team. That left him on the periphery and labelled as a big fish who could make waves in a small pond, but a player who would ultimately be out of his depth when surrounded by true 
quality. Not that he was really given the chance to prove that theory wrong. Frankly, if Letizia played for Manchester United, it would have been almost impossible for him to be left out of the England setup. There were plenty of players who were left off the England radar thanks in part to the stature of their club, notably Robbie Earle, who was often described as the Premier League's best player never to receive an England cap in the 90s. He played for my lowly team, Wimbledon, and eventually chose to declare for Jamaica. That paid off when he scored Jamaica's first ever goal at the World Cup Finals at France 98. It's also worth noting that his lack of major international tournament experience may have been because England kept failing to qualify for tournaments during his formative years and part of his prime. England didn't go to Euro 92 or USA 94 when Letizia was fresh-faced and working his magic. By the time Euro 96 came around, the aforementioned Paul Gascoigne was flavour of the month, understandably so, and he more than filled any appetite for midfield creativity. Attacking options were also plentiful for England around that time. So there you have it, Matthew Letizier was truly one of the all-time greats who was denied the chance to represent England time and time again because, well, he just wasn't the right kind of player. It's harsh and it seems ridiculous with hindsight, but it's true. Letizier remained close to the hearts of English fans in retirement when he became a regular panellist on Sky Sports Soccer Saturday right up until he was controversially sacked from the show last year in a drastic shake-up. His reputation was slightly sullied in the past year by his very outspoken views on the COVID-19 pandemic, including an unsavoury moment when he evoked Anne Frank to make a point about his freedoms, yeah. But for most soccer fans, he remains a genius on the field who scored the kind of goals most of us only dream about, and he simply didn't get to wear the Three Lions badge enough. I'm Ryan Bailey, this has been Soccer 101, thanks for listening. Oh,